Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship at St. John's Lutheran Church in beautiful Greenpoint, Brooklyn. I'm Reverend Richard Nordgren, and I will be, be presiding at the service today. And we're really, really glad that you came out on this beautiful summer morning you know, to worship with us. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's a fine day to be doing this. Uh, for those of you who are watching us uh, remotely, I uh, encourage you to click onto the bulletin so that you can follow with us as we sing our praises to God and give thanks you know, and listen to his word and its interpretation. I ask you now to rise as we read the introduction and proceed to confession and assurance of pardon. God is the source of our nourishment. Jesus invites to take and eat, take and drink in a repeated one, in Holy Communion, in the word read and proclaimed, in the assembly of the people of God, the dominion of God has come near. Rejoice, your name is written in heaven. Blessed be the whole of Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love endures forever. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not followed your path, but have chosen our own way. Instead of putting others before ourselves, we long to take the best seat at the table. When met by those in need, we too often have passed by on the other side. Set us again on the path of life, Save us from ourselves and free us to love our neighbors. Amen. Hear the good news. God does not deal with us according to our sins, but delights in granting pardon and mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ, I declare to you that your sins are forgiven. You are free to love God as God loves us. Amen. Now we'll join together in the opening hymn as a mother confronts her child. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O oh God, the Father of our Lord Jesus, you are the city that shelters us, the mother who comforts us, with your spirit accompanying us on our life's journey, that we may spread your peace in all the world, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. The first reading for this, the fifth Sunday in Pentecost, is read from the 30th chapter of Deuteronomy, beginning at the ninth verse. A reading from Deuteronomy. 
And the Lord your God will make you abundantly prosperous in all your undertakings, in the fruit of your body, in the fruit of your livestock, and in the fruit of your soil. For the Lord will again take delight in prospering you, just as he delighted in prospering your ancestors. When you obey the Lord your God by observing his commandments and decrees that are written in this book of the law, because you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul. Surely this commandment that I am commanding you today is not too hard for you, nor is it too far away. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will go up to heaven for us and get it for us so that we may hear it and observe it? Neither it is in the sea that you would say, who would cross to the other side of the sea for us and get it for us so that we may hear it and observe it? No, the word is very near to you. It is in your mouth and in your heart for you to observe the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's read responsively from Psalm 25, beginning at the first verse. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, God in you do I trust. Do not let me be to shame. Do not let my enemies exult over me. Do not let those who wait for you be put to shame. Let them be, let them be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation, for you I will wait all day long. Be mindful, mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your, your steadfast, steadfast love, for they have, have been told been from of old. Do we not remember the sins of my youth nor my transgressions? According to your steadfast love, remember me for your goodness sake, O Lord. Good, Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep word and keep the trees. The second reading is from Paul's letter to the Colossians, first chapter, beginning at the first verse. A reading from Colossians. Paul, an apostle of Christ, by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to all, all the saints and faithful brothers and sisters in Christ and Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. In our prayers for you, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for the gospel acclamation. Hallelujah, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Sorry. The gospel according to St. Luke in the 10th chapter, beginning with the 25th verse. Glory Holy gospel Lord. according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. As we read through and study the gospels you know, for this season, it is, uh, it is very clear that Jesus was a, a man on a mission. He was convinced that the kingdom of God was at hand and it was up to him to make the birth announcement. However, his reluctance to identify himself publicly as the agent of that inbreaking of God's kingdom and his decision to make the announcement to a small group of people hindered progress. 
Jesus, for some reason, did not use his superpowers you know, to let the whole world know of the good news that God's kingdom was at hand. Rather, he was an itinerant preacher. He, he taught as a sage. He was a wonderful storyteller. He functioned as a healer. And he was a prophet, you know, given to the use of parables. Come with me this morning as we delve into just one of those parables. You know? And uh, it was a parable that Jesus used to announce and define the kingdom of God. Now, I, I don't think it's controversial for me to say to you that the parable of the Good Samaritan is probably the best known of the lot. You know? I mean, who hasn't heard about the Good Samaritan? You, know, you may not know what his goodness consisted in. You may not even know what a Samaritan is. Well, you've heard of the Good Samaritan. Yeah? We all have. Yeah? Um, clearly, yeah, it's uh, a beloved story that is told in, in Luke's gospel. It's one of the, the longer parables. Yeah? It's certainly much longer than the parable of the mustard seed, which is one very terse and brief sentence. And you know, unlike some of the other parables, like the parable of the leaven, you know, its, uh, its message seems so obviously apparent. Be a decent human being, you know? do good. Um, but be not deceived by its simplicity and apparent transparency, where there is far more embedded in this parable than meets the eye. Uh, and to, to see what this parable has to bring to us, we first need to, to get into the, the details, into the weeds that uh, set up the parable, the conversation between Jesus and a lawyer. So the, uh, the question that the lawyer brought to Jesus, you know, sets this up. You know, and he asked, you know, how can I have eternal life? Well, two things ought to be apparent at this point. You know, one, he's an attorney. You know, and um, excuses to all who may be in that profession and watching me speak. You know, uh, attorneys did not have a good reputation back then either. You know. um, <clears throat> the other thing is, is that asking about eternal life tips his hand, you know, that he was not a Sadducee. They did not believe in eternal life. Okay. So, we ought to be on guard as we uh, listen to the exchange between Jesus and this fellow. Yeah. Um, as I said, there's you know, little doubt that he was part of the privileged elite of Jerusalem. Um, he was or may have been aligned or part of the, the faction that was uh, put on edge by the proclamation of Jesus that the uh, kingdom of God was at hand. Um, but on the other hand, and we don't know, we can only speculate. On the other hand, you know, he may have been a true inquirer. He was seeking, you know, to, uh, to find out. In uh, Matthew's version of this exchange, you know, he does come across as uh, an honest inquirer. Not so much in Luke. You know? uh, in Luke, he seems to be more intent on, you know, pinning Jesus down in a compromising position. Now, we have to acknowledge that Jesus was no naive fool when it comes to such sorts of, of traps being set for him. So he, uh, he answers the question with a question. Wonderful rhetorical device. So he asked the lawyer, what does the law say? The lawyer responded you know, by saying, you know, well, we should love God with our entire being, all our strength, you know, everything that we have should be focused on that. And also the second part of the law uh, is that we ought to love our neighbors as ourselves. I can see Jesus patting this guy in the back and saying, well done, correct answer. You know, if you do these things, eternal life is yours. Um, the setup though, merely prepositions us to look at the parable of the Good Samaritan. It does, in and of itself, it does not bring us you know, to the main point of the parable. In fact, we 
you really haven't even touched about what the parable means. No. But before we can get into the, the story of the Good Samaritan, a few things you know, have to be laid out you know, for our consideration. The Jewish people you know, had a functioning system for the repair of damaged relationships caused by sin, damage to their relationship with God and with one another. You know? Um, and as Jesus makes clear in this setup, you know, eternal life you know, is not dependent on faith on him. You know? It depends on loving God with our entire being and focused on loving our neighbor as ourselves. The third thing which you know, is contained in the, the setup is the declaration that salvation does not lie in the hands of the, in, lies in the hands of the individual, not the nation. In other words, the you know, majority of the people you know, could be condemned, but a few righteous souls could be spared their fate. Hitherto, it had been taken for granted that you know, it was the entire community or none of the community that would benefit from God's salvation. And finally, you know, here and elsewhere, Jesus makes clear that what he has to offer, the gifts of God, you know, uh, are not limited to a most favored nation. They're available to all of creation. So Jesus tells the story about you know, uh, a man who was traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, and it was his misfortune on that day to be beset by robbers who beat him mercilessly, who stripped him of all his belongings, and thinking he was near death, left him on the side of the road to expire. Not a very pleasant thing. You know? And so there he was lying in the ditch, you know, hoping someone would come by and help him. And he heard the footsteps of a man who turned out to be a priest who looked and saw him in the ditch but continued on his way. And shortly thereafter, you know, uh, a Levite, same thing, saw him in the ditch and continued on his way. The third person to approach the man in the ditch you know, was a Samaritan. And filled with compassion, you know, he stopped, attended to the man's wounds, put him on his beast of burden, took him to an inn, paid for his recovery, and said, you know, if there's more owed, I will come back and pay you for it, but take care of it. Yeah. So Jesus tells the story and asks the attorney you know, a follow-on question. Who is the neighbor? It's a legitimate question but it's one that never gets answered. Nowhere in the breadth of this story you know, is a definition of neighbor offered. You may assume that you know, he was thinking of you know, his countrymen, you know, perhaps. Um, but I think his scope of concern was much broader than his fellow Galileans. I think Jesus' answer you know, to the question about neighbor you know, is far more you know, concerned with what people do you know, uh, when there's opportunity to behave like a good neighbor. You see, this, uh, this fella, the Samaritan, is not a beloved you know, individual you know, within the Jewish community. You know? uh, he, uh, he was probably despised by most of them, if not hated. You know? And as we get into the Gospels, you know, we, we recognize that, you know, there was not uh, a lot of, you know, sitting by the campfire singing Kumbaya going on in Jerusalem in those days. You know. There was a lot of tension in society. You know, there were arguments and disagreements about what requirements of the law were the most important. And, you know, that should not be a surprise because even in our own day, you know, there's a lot of divisiveness about what's most important for us to do as Americans, you know? You, know, you ask uh, three people and you get 17 different opinions. You know? so we are creatures of habit of our own thought world. You know? uh, we see things through a prism and from a perspective that you know, reflects what is important to us. And from that perspective, you know, our behavior flows. Now, the priest and the Levite were, were temple functionaries, and 
for the purposes of their parable, it's safe to assume that their devotion to the sacramental ministry that they were called to perform was of the utmost importance to them. Assuming reasonably, I believe, that they were headed toward Jerusalem you know, to take their stations you know, to perform the rites and rituals that they were called to perform, you know, they may have thought, well, if I stop and render aid, I may be delayed, or even worse, I may be you know, ritually um, impure. Yeah. Um, so unfortunately for the man who's lying in the ditch, you know, two potential rescuers, you know, he had other things that they deemed more important than helping him. And it was the despised Samaritan who stopped and, and rendered aid. Now this, this parable is a, a variant, uh, sort of an ethnic variant, if you will, uh, upon other things that Jesus taught, such as in Matthew 5, 43, where he told his, uh, his friends that, you know, God doesn't play favorites anymore. You know, if you need sunshine and rain for your crops to grow, then God will give that to you. It doesn't matter, you know, who you are, what your parents were like, you know, what tribe, clan, or country you are from, whether you're a good person or a bad person, whether you're deserving poor or some sort of scoundrel. The rain and the sun will come to you and all alike. You know. What God has to give, According to Jesus, he gives generously and he gives it to all. Now, that's good news for most of us, you know, but for those who believe that they were part of a most favored nation, um, they may have been wondering, wait a minute, that's changing the rules in the middle of the game. Yeah, yeah it was. Because if this is what Jesus was announcing about the kingdom of God, you know, there is no longer a most favored nation and those that were despised. Jesus was saying, you know, God has no special friends. He's also saying he has no special enemies. Yeah. Well, this does cause for, call for an explanation. Yeah. Um, why this change? And what about the implications, you know, that come along with the, uh, the change that you're announcing? Yeah. For example, what about the you know, unrepentant who receive God's blessing and then continue in their unrighteous ways? You know, where's the justice in that? You know, and conversely, what's the incentive for doing good? You know, if everybody's gonna be treated similarly and treated you know, equally, you know, what, are, what are the benefits and advantages that would induce me you know, to not follow my natural instincts? These are just a few of the, the many questions you know, that uh, could easily come from this announcement of the change of conditions. I, I believe that as we get to understand the question that sets up the parable and the parable itself as an answer to a question not asked, you know, um, we're drawn to the conclusion that this is not a sweet story about you know, some good stranger doing a good deed. You know? uh, it is not a story about you know, priorities and, and in what order you know, uh, we ought to put things, you know, ritual purity, moral righteousness, loving kindness, you know, um, so on and so forth. You know, this is a parable that you know, announces you know, a, a new world order. Jesus did not define what it means to be a neighbor. Rather, he said that you know, God has no preferred friends or special enemies. That doesn't mean that you know, God has cozied up to evil and now accept that that is a reality and fact of life that we just have to live with like COVID. You know? Granted, God you know, will treat sinner and saint you know, according to the needs that they have. You know? uh, but that does not mean that the evil done by the sinner uh, is welcomed or cherished and honored by God. You know? There will be you know, a final accounting 
And that story is found in another parable, the parable of the sheep and the goats. Um, in that parable, Jesus returns to earth as the judge of the universe. And he meets people, and as they come forward, he separates some to his right and some to his left. And uh, then he announces, you know, uh, those, those of you who are placed on my right, you know, welcome. Your reward is at hand. The kingdom of God is yours. You know. uh, come and enjoy you know, God's love and presence for all eternity. And the fortunate on the right you know, might ask the question, you know, why have we been singled out for such fulsome gladness and good news? Judge Jesus told them, because you have taken care of him, and they asked, huh, when did we do that? How did we do it? What are you talking about? And Jesus, the judge said, you did it to me whenever you helped a person in need of help. The others on the left, you know, were condemned. Why us, they asked. And Jesus, as judge, responded to them by saying, because you did nothing when it was within your ability to help. As I said, the parable does not define neighbor. It doesn't even tell us what we ought to do. It assumes that you know, we uh, have been instructed on what it means to be a decent human being. And it is our task when we come across the material situation of individuals who need help to draw upon what we have learned and what the Holy Spirit guides and draws us to do in response to the material situation of those that we see in need of help. Excuse me. <clears throat> this is not a theoretical discussion. It's not about an ideal situation that clearly defines who's deserving and who is not. It is a down-to-earth, real-life, practical point of view, perspective. <clears throat> Jesus has already made it clear that God you know, has no limits on his concern for anyone or anything in creation. It is only the material situation you know, uh, of an individual that will determine what it means to be a good neighbor. And who is the neighbor? Those people whose material situation calls for us a response. No. I think this is one of those occasions where once again we should follow his lead and refuse to get worked up trying to find a definition of who is neighbor that we're obligated to help. Take, for example, you know, the hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people who have come to our southern border who have risked so much to come to our country. And our response has been more often than not a debate, you know, which takes on racial categories, but very stridently declares, declared by some that our neighbor is people who are born in the United States who have skin color like ours, you know, who believe the way we believe, you know, and everybody else you know, can suck their thumb. These people who congregated at our southern borders hoping to gain admittance to this country have oftentimes you know, left their native land because they were in danger of being murdered you know, or treated you know, like the Good Samaritan, uh, about the guy in the ditch that the Good Samaritan came to help. It's a political debate you know, about who is and who is not included in our circle of concern as American citizens. But I submit to you, that's not a good starting place. You know? There are in these stories, these parables, you know, many gems you know, which we can dig out. You know? They're rich with implications. You know? Thinking about you know, the refugees who have come to us, you know, uh, their material situation does call for a response on our part, rather than getting into the the ugliness of saying who's worthy of our concern and who can deal with fate as it comes their way. 
As far as our accounting is concerned, our fate you know, will be determined by the quality and quantity of loving acts of kindness that uh, the material situation of people in the ditch call us to respond. It's not by some set of arbitrary check boxes that we have to fulfill. It's by the, the quality and quantity of our loving acts of kindness. Also, <clears throat> unlike the uh, priest and the Levite, uh, we ought not to separate ourselves and say, you know, we are the blessed few, the elect, you know, who uh, you know, are exempt from moral obligations to people outside our circle. You know, even a sinner, maybe an angel in disguise. And God alone you know, is worthy of whom he's going to spend eternity with until that future sorting out takes place. We are called to love all people without an examination of their worthiness. Love them as we would love ourselves. What Jesus calls us to do in these, these stories you know, requires you know, an infinite amount of patience and tolerance. You know? It is a taxing requirement on our natural instincts. You know? We are more inclined, I think, to respond to evil with the means of evil. But uh, Jesus resisted that temptation uh, throughout his career. In closing, you know, I'd like to repeat that this, this parable does not tell us anything new. Uh, it does not call us you know, to define neighbor because God has already done that. And God has let it be known that the entire universe is within his circle of compassionate care. <clears throat> we ought to be asking the question about neighborliness, not in terms of some theoretical or political debate, you know, who is or who is not. As I said, you know, God has already determined that. It is up to us you know, to understand the situation that these people find themselves in and draw upon our faith in the work of the Holy Spirit to see how we ought to respond to this situation. Not every situation will be the same, and each new situation calls for a different response. But it is of the utmost importance you know, to keep faith with, with Jesus you know, by avoiding the temptation to get into a theoretical debate and propose idealistic standards of neighborliness uh, that miss the point about you know, the, uh, the helping. That Samaritan was good in part because he had compassion and in part because he offered you know, the appropriate type of help. But he was also good because he refused to get drawn into a pointless and fruitless debate about who was his neighbor. He assumed, as God does, you know, that the fellow in the ditch, bleeding and broken, you know, was his neighbor, even though a stranger, even though probably of a different group than his own. You know, but he recognized that he was called you know, to respond because this man in the ditch you know, was part of God's concern. It was up to him to do his part. I encourage you to, to pray you know, that um, you will not be drawn down that slippery slope that seeks to define you know, who is and who isn't you know, part of that circle of compassionate concern, you know? but rather to be thinking and praying about you know, how we can respond you know, to the material situation of people we might be able to help so that we might enjoy you know, the fulsome love and blessing that our Lord offers. And finally, remember this. Jesus loves them as much as he leaves up, loves us, and so do I. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, I ask you that your Holy Spirit work upon us 
so that these words of faith will become ingrained and integral to our thinking. That will no longer be internally divided or externally apart by theoretical discussions of who you really care for and who you have no concern for. Teach us you know, that your spirit you know, encompasses everybody throughout the universe. We ask this in your son's name, amen. I ask you to rise as we sing our um, song of the day. Will you let me be your servant? declare together what we believe using the words found in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Let us pray. United in Christ. Okay. United in Christ, guided by the Spirit, we pray for the church, the creation, and all in need. Lord of the harvest, you send your church into to proclaim Christ's new creation to all. Renew the church as it carries out your mission of peace and healing. We pray for missionaries who accompany your people. God of grace, hear our prayer. Your creation abounds with flowing waters and diverse creatures. Guide the work of climate scientists as they develop and advocate ways to restore Earth's natural balance. Motivate humankind to adopt lifestyles that protect and sustain the Earth. God of grace, hear our prayer. You guard the nations that no leaders exalt themselves, but lift up the most vulnerable and work for the good of all. Send your spirit to recap to eradicate classism and inequities, violence and war, poverty and hunger. God of grace, hear our prayer. You desire abundant life for all. As we celebrate this day, instill in us gratitude, generosity, persistence in working toward freedom for all people. God of grace, hear our prayer. 
Mother and God, you care for all people in need. Nourish those who are hungry. Restore employment to those who have lost work. Heal those who are sick and comfort all who are dying, especially those we have been asked to pray for. Lord, we lift up before you the people of Ukraine and Russia, people of Buffalo, New York, people of Vivaldi, Texas, people of Highland Park, Illinois, Gail Rogers, Walker Vreeland, Arena, Donna, Marcy, Priscilla, Franz, Laura, Diane, and Sarah, Linda Johnson and family, Caroline, baby Bella, Savita, Juan and the Delgado family, Abby, baby James, Adina, Michelle, Demon, Casey, Lucas, and Adrian, Adrian, Danny, Ryan, and Shane, Dion and Lisa, Miss Ruth, Jazz, Virginia Moses, Heather, Julian and Shirley, Robert, Jennifer, Hannah, and Kristen, Pamela and Zoya, and our pastor. For those living with mental illness, their families and friends, and all those who help them come to close to wholeness of body, mind, and spirit. For all in the ravages of addiction, that they might turn to you and seek recovery. All who are homeless, all who are incarcerated, and all who work in jails and prisons, all migrants and refugees, all students and teachers, especially those under under-resourced communities. For all essential workers, especially scientists, statisticians, social workers, teachers, professors, doctors, nurses, EMTs, midwives and funeral directors, union members and organizers, those who work in the Department of Sanitation, the MTA, FDNY, the NYPD, especially the 94th Precinct in which we are located, those in the National Guard and in our armed forces. We remember our nation's holy movements from the abolitionist movement, the civil rights movement, the gay and lesbian movement, the women's movement, Black Lives Matter movement, and the poor people's campaign. For all politicians, especially our President Joe, our Vice President Kamala, cabinet, staff, Congress, and the judiciary. We all pray for those facing financial distress, food and housing insecurity, that we would share the abundance entrusted to us so that all may have some rather than some having most. Remember those who have died, Zoya, Annabella Gravelens, Emily Gladstein, Roberta, Dawn, Sandy, Louise Mazzo, Martha Banfield, Kennard, John Victoria, Officer Wilbur Mora, Officer James Rivera, Anna Doyle, Raina, Ricky, Betty, Manfred, Rick, Roger, Kathy, Joseph, Mar, Herbie, Kate, Patty, Joyce, Phyllis. We pray for Ascension Lutheran and Father John Mertz, for St. Michael's and Incarnation Lutheran Churches and the Reverend George Dietrich, for the Fordham Evangelical Lutheran Church. We pray for St. John's Lutheran Church, which is our church and its council, all of our members and those who will become members that we would always invite and welcome God's kids in the name of Jesus. For our Bishop Elizabeth and Paul, and for all pastors, deacons, priests, rabbis, imams, and chaplains, that we all that may serve with joy and grace. God of grace, hear our prayer. We remember the saints who proclaimed your reign on earth and now rest in peace. They make us faithful witnesses to Christ's new creation. God of grace, hear our prayer. God of every time and place, in Jesus' name, and filled with your Holy Spirit, we entrust these spoken prayers and those in our hearts to your holy keeping. Amen. Peace of the Lord be with you always. Peace. All right, you may be seated. Yeah, yeah, you see. Uh, this is the time when I want to encourage you to, to make a, a donation to this church or to some good cause, which, you know, makes you jump for joy. Um, 
as you've heard said on the numerous occasions, you know, Jesus doesn't need the money, but to do the work of Jesus that we've been called to do, we do need your help. You know? And the donations that come to this church support its ministries. And they're gladly received and used you know, for causes that uh, we have endorsed you know, as befitting us as people of faith. So if you want to give online, you know, there's a, uh, uh, a link that's in the bulletin. If you uh, want to, to leave a gift this morning, uh, there is a plate you know, on the table by the exit. Uh, we encourage you to use uh, one or both you know, means of, of sharing you know, your riches with those you know, who can use it. Join with me in prayer. O oh God of justice and love, we give thanks to you that you illumine our way through life, through the life in the wor words of your son. Give us the light we need, awaken to us the needs of others. At the end, bring all the world to your feast. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit, we honor and glorify forever. Amen. On the night that he was betrayed, our Lord took bread and having given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his friends, telling them, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. In a like manner, after they had eaten, you know, he, uh, he took the cup. And having given thanks again, he gave it to them and said, Drink all of you from this cup, for this is the new covenant sealed in my blood. Whatever you drink of it, you know, do so in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Our Lord and our God, may these elements, bread and cup, be for us, you know, your real presence in our midst this morning. May we take them with the grace and elegance with which they were given. Common, simple elements, you know, yet they nourish us in body and spirit. Now, Lord, hear us as we pray, using the words that Jesus taught us to use. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As you come forward to receive the elements, proceed with your hands open and I will dispense a piece of bread into your hand. In the, uh, the tray are cups on the outer perimeter. Cups are with wine. Those in the center with the lids on them are uh, grape juice. This is uh, the holy feast of God's people. Come and receive the grace of our Lord.
Let's give thanks. Lord, we have truly been blessed by your presence in the bread that we ate and the cup from which we drank. When we gather at your table, we fulfill an ancient prophecy that people from all over, from the east and from the west and from the north and south, will be gathered in your presence, be nourished in body and in spirit. And this very day, once again, that prophecy has been fulfilled. Thank you in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Ah, I'd like to bring to your attention some announcements. Um, that, uh, I got it on. Oh, I thought it did. Okay. Announcements, okay. All right, um, Tuesday night, eight o'clock, uh, we have the co-conspirators uh, worship service. It's uh, online. The uh, link to the uh, Zoom meeting is there in the bulletin. And we encourage you all to come. You know, it's a it's a more of a conversational worship service than any other type, you know, um, where we get together to study and reflect upon, you know, a um, question of the day in a supporting text from scripture. There will not be a Bible study tonight. Uh, I've decided not to do that this summer. Um, uh, so that, uh, uh, this uh, Wednesday evening, there will be a, another Zoom meeting uh, uh, for the entire congregation where you know, the council and pastoral leaders you know, will be available to answer any of your questions that have arisen you know, since the, um, the death of uh, Zoya and uh, our pastor taking a sabbatical to mourn you know, her loss. So I encourage you to get that. There will be a uh, email message sent out about how to attend that meeting. So really encourage you to, to do that. I want to thank everybody who had a hand in making this a, uh, a service uh, worthy of God's blessing. Uh, and so I'm grateful for that. As also we are grateful for those who um, have shared their bounty so that uh, you know all may have some. Now I ask you to, to rise and we'll sing our departing hymn. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. Mm -hmm. 